Thank you. Th th thanks, Chair, and thank you everybody for coming. And it's great to see so many of you again. Um, Christina, I thought that last statement that you made was was the most important, really, um, because it, it, it paints the picture of what women are going back to and the choices that they're having to make. If I could just say at the outset, uh, I'm constantly challenged by the premise that women have to leave. I spoke with a woman yesterday who's um, stuck in a family law situation going back to May 2019, where she and her three children left and uh, for an abusive situation, and she is still struggling to find accommodation while uh, her partner remains in their family home. This is not a story that is new to any of you, so you don't need me telling it. Um, just wanted to ask a couple of specific questions, uh, very tight because there's, there's so little time, if you don't mind. Um, Ms McDermott um, from Safe Ireland, first thing is just I want to get to congratulate you again on the No Going Back document, which I found really powerful. Thank you for coming to Iraq this members to talk to about it. I just wanted to ask two things. You mentioned there about the delay from Tusla, and I thought you described it very diplomatically, um, that you were keen to see it, and I'm sure other other providers are too. Can you just, uh, get, I'd like to give you the opportunity to maybe to expand a bit more, or maybe I'll just ask you directly, why do you think uh, it is so slow when it was due Q1 of this year, I think? Or what's the what's the issue? Well, I mean, the, the simple answer to that, uh, Deputy, is that we're not in Tusla, so we don't know. <laughs> um, however, we have participated in the work over two years, and we've, as, as part of the National Monitoring Committee, we had a preview of some of the early findings. There seems to be a large amount of material. But I think there is a bigger question, and that is exactly where, you know, accommodation lies. This is a huge problem within government generally. So everybody is essentially passing the buck about who, who exactly is responsible for those made homeless, either correctly or incorrectly, as you're talking about in the context of, you know, a safe at home shelter where people should really write, women should be staying at home. But where they are made homeless, who who who, who steps in here? Who takes responsibility for them? So I think Tusla find themselves in, in a certain problem there uh, structurally that they have no remit strictly around accommodation. And uh, we find ourselves passed from Billy to Jack. And actually, as is clear from the budget, if I might speak forthrightly here, uh, domestic violence was raised the national budget, uh, it's almost completely invisible, which is shocking given this, the fact that it was a national priority for the last two years in COVID. So I'm not sure if that answers your uh, question, Deputy, but the issue here is really the nature of homelessness as it arises from domestic violence and who precisely has responsibility for it. In relation to the publication of the review by Tusla, it was a very thorough engagement. We, to the best of our knowledge, uh, uh, you know, really see that Tusla have taken on board the fact that there will always need to be wraparound services provided wherever accommodation it is not about beds. Okay, uh, and so that's perhaps yeah. a response to you. I'm and sorry. I think it's really important when you think about a woman and her children, or a man and his mm -hmm. children going into a refuge. The behaviour of those children could be very challenging for very good reasons. It's a very, you know, yeah. it's, it's a very traumatic situation that they have yeah. gone through, and having that trauma-based response in, um, is, is is so important at, at that very early stage. And um, Ms. Bentley, could I come to you and just ask you? Um, I think what you're, you know, it's, it's very important that you're here, that your organisation is here. And the more I learn, the more I, I learn about how little I, I, I know, you know, it's important, uh, particularly about violence to men. And I don't accept and I never would accept that abuse only happens in one direction or by one gender. Abuse by any gender to any gender is unacceptable. Um, and I think what's masked, you know, is it, it, I think it's important what you've highlighted around homelessness and suicide. Um, the, could you just ask you in particular, just coming up to Christmas, short term plans on a practical basis, have, is there anything that you, mm -hmm. you know, can you give the c c committee any, any information about anything that, that's going on there? Yeah, I suppose um, we're getting more calls, um, I suppose, in the last number of weeks. And we, we've reached out to a couple of our colleagues and in particular, Sunus has come forward. So we're actually speaking with Sunus for a short term solution for Christmas. Um, to it, It's in addition to their portfolio of housing. And, and case by case, it's not going to be a long-term answer. It's not going to address the issue um, because we would have, because we know that men are not actually even asking for, for refuge because it doesn't exist as of yet. But there are some very dangerous cases that we have where children are being left in the home among abuse. So we, we do want to help these, these dads and these children in the run-up to Christmas. So we will be working short-term as a case by case, I suppose, if I call it a pilot with Sunnis in the coming weeks and months, and then hopefully if, if we can take those learnings and, and obviously roll that through into 2022. Um, I'm even helping a, a local person here in my own constituency since, since Thursday. He was made homeless on Sunday. On paper, he's a millionaire, 
um, but he, as of Sunday, he he is homeless. So um, we have some very live situations, you know, day to day, every day, daily. Um, okay. I suppose we're looking forward to working with Sunnis on that, hopefully. Um, Ms. Graham, could I just uh, congratulate you on your new position and uh, thank your organisation for um, having me out to uh, last November to Searsha to see the work that, that you're all doing and Nadine in particular, whom, whom I spent time with. Can I just ask you in relation to Tusla and the importance of multi-annual funding? I have this sense that the service level agreements are being agreed very late in the year and I don't know if that's the experience of providers, but it seems to me that that would make it very difficult to plan Um you know, you're talking about the spaces that you have. I know you've done some upgrades there in the last number of years. Um, how, how does that work for the benefit of committee members? When do you when are you sure about your budget? Um, yeah, thanks, Jennifer, for sure. Um, the confirmation of funding never happens in the year um, before you come into it. So, so sorry, you honest, never, you're never sure of that year's budget in that year. So, like, 2022 budget um, has not been discussed yet in terms of the confirmation of it. So, the confirmation happens in the year. How are you going to the plan year. then, Ms. Graham? Sorry, that just seems uh, ridiculous. So, you're saying to me that it's now November 2021 and that you don't have clarity for your 2022 budget and yet you have to plan staff, works and all sorts of things like that? Yeah, it is. It's it's extremely difficult to plan. And to be honest, in some previous years, the confirmation may not come until towards the end of the year, which happened actually last year. Our budget was not confirmed based on the SLA until towards the end of 2020. So um, your 2020 budget, you're operating in 2020. You didn't have confirmation and clarity on your 2020 budget till the end of 2020. Yes. Yeah. That sounds unbe- I don't. I'm not saying it is unbelievable. It sounds unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does. Um, and as you said, we've been looking for many years for a, a multi-annual budget confirmation and a service level agreement. And TUSLA, to be honest, have said that that's something they're looking at, but there's nothing concrete coming down the line. And it, it makes it extremely difficult to plan anything. Like as an agency, we are at, in the middle of doing our five-year strategic plan for ourselves now from 2022 on. And it's, it's impossible to plan in terms of what's going to happen year on year whether your core funding is going to be maintained or whether it's going to be cut or what's going to happen. And to try and plan future services is impossible. So, yeah. Thank you. My time is going to be going to be up now, but I just wanted to make one point that I raised in the doll today, which is around the importance, I believe, of a new relationship and sexual education program, age appropriate from the earliest stage in schools. And if that's something that these organ your, your, your all of your organisations believe is important, I'd, I'd urge you to try to to help um, speak out on that uh, over the over the you know as 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 weeks progress. So it just it's just it's more of an ask in case I don't get back in.